It's go time. Welcome everyone to Quick Kicks here on Third Down Gamble. Don Charbon hosting and today a very special guest, TSN 1050's voice of the Toronto Argos, Mike Hogan. Welcome to the show. Great to finally talk to you. I'm stoked about this. That's a great gig doing the Argonauts on uh, radio. Yeah, it's it, it's been cool because when I left radio full time, I was still able to do the play by play. So, you know, being able to combine that love, that first 35 years of my professional life to uh, to what I'm doing now as communications manager with the Argos for the last four five years now, uh, it's it's really the best of both worlds. Uh, now let's. Let's talk about where you got started in all this. Did you grow up in Southern Ontario? We are all, always an Argonauts fan. How did this all play together? Uh, I grew up in the thriving metropolis of Kingston, Ontario. I was a baseball guy growing up in a hockey town, which is funny how now I've been football for most of my life. But um, yeah, grew up in Kingston, was a sports fan where if there was something on TV, I would watch it. Uh, if there was something I could play outside, I would play it. An Expos fanatic. Uh, I became a Sabres fan early on because I thought their uniforms were really cool. My favorite color is blue. Became a Rams fan in the NFL and an Argos fan in the CFL. have been an Argos fan since. Uh, the Expos have been taken away. I became a Hartford Whalers fan at one point. Transitioned from Rams to Eagles uh, in the mid-70s when Roman Gabriel got traded, but have kept that Argo allegiance since. Uh, the first game I remember vividly watching was the 71 Great Cup. And that is quite a game to remember. Of course, Leon McQuay slips and the Argos fall. I live uh, I live just off McQuay Boulevard in Whitby. So every day I come home, I have to drive up McQuay Boulevard, and there's not a single time I look at that sign and don't go, Ugh. That must be rough. So as a, as a teenager, okay, okay, you're you're following sports, you're playing sports, but where does this career start? Where Are you thinking about it as a kid? Would I like to be in broadcasting? It was neat because I had an old uh, classmate who I went from kindergarten to high school with reach out and she said, the coolest thing about you is I remember doing an assignment. It was like for a fake newspaper that you had to put together in like grade two. And she interviewed me and I said that I wanted to be a sports writer. So, yeah, it's been there. You know, obviously my dream was to pitch for the Expos, but that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, I, I was a kid that fell in love with radio specifically. And would I, I thought the coolest thing in the world was, you know, here in, in the eastern part of the country, uh, you're so close to so many major American markets that at night you would be able to listen to most of the major markets. So if I went to bed and the Expos had played an afternoon game, I'd be, you know, with the little radio, transistor radio, trying to find – you know, a game in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or Boston or New York, and they all boom into draw into Kingston at the time. So, you know, I was that guy. I was intrigued by talk radio before, you know, there ever was a dream of sports radio. Uh, I'd, I'd listen to talk shows at night. Larry Glick at WBZ in Boston uh, was a guy I listened to a lot as a kid. So it was all, radio was a lifelong dream. Went into it. I got into college at Loyalist College in Belleville, Ontario, which is about an hour west of Kingston. And I've been around and working in in radio for the most part for 35 years until making a relatively late in my career transition to uh, to the CFL. What was that first radio job? I worked uh, doing part time weekend sports in Kingston at CKWS. That turned into a news and sports radio and television gig for four years, and then. I got fired, and uh, I was hired by the competition about a week later. Um, they were very happy to bring me aboard, and I worked there for a year, then up to Ottawa. Uh, worked at a rock station there for a couple of years. As uh, I started out as a reporter, they moved me into being the morning news anchor, and I also got to cover the CFL for the first time uh, with Ottawa. I was able to, to cover the riders for a year or two, and... Uh, then it was off to Toronto, Fan 590, TSN 1050. So, yeah, I got uh, I, I got some breaks along the way and was very happy to take advantage of it. When did you become the voice of the Toronto Argonauts? What, what made that path available to you? I was working at the Fan 590, which was, you know, the first all, I think we were the fifth all-sports station in North America. 
and we had Blue Jay rights and we had Leaf rights, but a, comp, a competitor had the Argo rights. When the Argo rights became available, uh, the Fan 590 thought, okay, let's try this. And when they did, I went up and, and, and said, I'd love to do this because I had volunteered to do uh, Vania Cup games when the, when, when the fan had sort of dipped its toe in to football broadcasting. So I had done a handful of Vanier Cups. That led to a job in Hamilton doing the OUA Game of the Week, uh, which was a provincial broadcast. And it was kind of there I got my chops for a couple of years. And it was a fairly easy transition to, to put a guy with football play-by-play experience because not a lot of people do. Like everybody does hockey. But there aren't a lot of guys who have uh, who have done football play by play, and it seemed a natural fit. And uh, we lost the the rights for four or five years, but since 2000, essentially, I've been doing play by play with the Argos. That's fantastic. Do you remember your first game that you called? First one was a preseason game, and I can't remember if, if we had the home. I think the first one I did was in Winnipeg, um, and then we had a home game against Montreal, and the first regular season game was in Saskatchewan. It was a John Heward year, uh, so I thought crazy was the norm <laughs> because of what I was exposed to. And the Argos won their first game. I think Daryl Mitchell had three touchdowns, and uh, one was on an illegal forward lateral from pinball uh, that they didn't call. The Argos got away with that one. So that was the first one. Uh, you know, what a way to start in Regina. And the Argos, through your tour, I've, I've kind of had a sine wave where at times they've been up, at times they've been down. It's uh, It makes it interesting, though, to follow them, doesn't it? It's like any team in the CFL. The highs seem exceptionally high, and the lows are just abysmal. So uh, to be able to get through the John Heward year, and half year, the Bart Andrus year was not a lot of fun uh, in terms of the on-field stuff. But great cups. Um, I've got three rings, or we'll be getting my third one. So uh, there have been some pretty high highs as well. So... Uh, yeah, it's like any team in the CFL, except Calgary. Calgary always seems to be great, although they had that Save Our Stamps campaign back in the 80s. Uh, for the most part, you know, Calgary's been that franchise uh, after Edmonton had been that team for so long. That's very true. The The Edmonton franchise from about 1970 to 2000, or even just into the new century, was dominant. Calgary kind of took the mantle. But yeah, but, you, know, you know, Mike Clemens, our general manager, wants to be that team. Bear with me if you've heard the story before, but we had our first meeting with Mike when he took over as general manager from Jim Pop. Mike brought us all into the room. The the, the football ops people are, I don't know, a dozen or so of us in there. And he, he said, I want to make this team boring. This has to be the most boring team in sports. So we all kind of looked around at each other and said, what do you mean? He said, I want people to be used to us doing the right thing all the time. Where if we do something right, it's not unexpected. It's expected. We have to be that team. We have to be Calgary. We have to be Montreal back in the day. We have to be Edmonton back in the day. We have to be the team that does the right thing all the time. Uh, You know, there's the Patriot way in in the NFL that was, you know, the the standard for so many years. That's what we're trying to do in Toronto. And, you know, in Mike's tenure uh, as general manager, we've been to the Eastern Final twice. We won the Grey Cup once. So there haven't been very many fires since pinball took over. And, uh, you know, with him and Vince Magri and Brian Dinwiddie and, uh, you know, Jim Barker now back in the fold and Alex Russell, we're, we're in pretty good hands. Of course, people may not remember that uh, Mike Clemens coached the Argonauts to a Grey Cup. Yeah, 2004. I wasn't doing play-by-play that year. I was, uh, uh, was a fan and, and thrilled watching Mike do what he did. I was, it was in 2000 when, when my first year where Mike replaced John Heward in midseason and became a player coach for a couple of games. He coached, then played for two games, and then went back into coaching full time. And, uh, you know, he took a ridiculously bad situation and actually put the Argos back on a bit of a run at the end of the season. So you could tell something was there. He got out of it. He became the president. Uh, Gary Echeverry took over. And then Mike came back a year and a half later. And then another year after that, they're in the Grey Cup. So he works magic. He's 7 and 0 in Grey Cup. So he knows how to win. Uh, you know, 87 was the last one the Argos lost. Mike came in 89, and it's been seven straight since then. So um, it might be somewhat of a coincidence, but not a lot. When you look at Mike's contributions uh, to three of those as a player, as a head coach, and certainly his contributions uh, off the field as uh, as an executive and certainly hands-on as general manager. So he's uh, 
He knows how to win. There's no question about that. Who have been your color analysts during your tour? Oh, boy. With the Argos, uh, it was Pete Martin. Did it uh, 2000, 2001, and then 2007 until 2011. Then Sandy Anunziata came in, and then Jeff Johnson came in, and then he moved, and then Chris Schultz came in. Uh, and when Schultz passed, we needed somebody. Natea J was uh, was the color voice. And then Nate got a job this year halfway through the season in Bahrain uh, that he couldn't pass up. So he and the family moved halfway around the world. So he couldn't commute. And uh, Bob Bronk filled in for the rest of the season, although Ben Grant did one game. So uh, there have been a lot of guys. I'm, I, I, I kind of uh, – I'm spinal tap, and the color voice has turned into the drummer. Uh, there have been a lot of guys who have gone through the uh, – have gone through the role, but all of them have brought something different, and all I've learned from every one of them. Uh, I've been incredibly fortunate uh, to have the the bevy of uh, of wingers that I've had. What is game day to you? Uh, being a part of the franchise is one thing, but now you've got to go out there and call a game. What what does your day start as? Um, I try to have everything done the night before, although that never works out the way that it should, and I can always find something else to do the next morning. I, I spent about three or four hours prepping boards, uh, cheat sheets, as it were. Um, I'll take a poster board, cut it in four, and I'll put a team's offense on one side, their defense on the other, and then I'll do the other uh, for the other team. So I have statistics, personal notes, any notes that I've come up with over the week. Um, I probably use about 20% of what I do, but I, I've got it up here. So if I need to double check a stat or something, it's there. Um, so that's a lot of prep. I prepare the game notes for the media now. So that's helped because I've got my preparation done that way throughout the course of the week. So that takes quite a bit of time as well. And then game day, it's, I'm usually there four hours beforehand. Uh, I'll go into the locker room. I'll talk to a coach or a player, just kind of find out another tidbit, go out on the field, uh, catch up with some, uh, people, uh, from the other team, say, how you doing? And maybe, I catch up with them a little bit, and then it's uh, upstairs. Uh, this year I've been doing some uh, some public speaking as well. We have youth groups come in before every game. Uh, so I'll sit down and I'll talk to them about, you know, the Argos. We're in a heavy NFL market, obviously, in Toronto. It's something we're fighting, and just kind of get them used to what the CFL, what, what they may not know about the CFL. Every group that I've spoken to is beyond shocked when they find out that Toronto is a great birthplace of football. Uh, the football started with the University of Toronto in 1861. Uh, and then McGill, after uh, after playing U of T, took it down to the United States. So uh, football is a Toronto thing. And I think most people and even people watching this right now may go, what? Uh, but yeah, 1861 is the first documented football game, uh, an inter-squad game at the U of T. And of course, a lot of uh, waves have been made when Dave Groh in that ad causes the football to say, yeah, and football was invented in Canada. Yep, it was, and uh, you know maybe that will will bring some of the people who have been knocked the CFL for so long. Uh, you know we have that in this market. I've, ne- I've never understood because I've gr- I grew up maybe outside of a an NFL or CFL market, uh, so I took both games and, and love them equally. U sports, like I grew up watching Queens football. Uh, I love U sports football. I've never understood why CFL fans hate the NFL. I've never understood why NFL fans hate the CFL. Like if you look at it this way. If, if, if you grow up in Texas or, or Ohio, one of the, Pennsylvania, one of the real hotbeds for high school football, you're going to go to a high school game on Friday night. You're going to love it. And you're going to get into the players. You're going to research them. And you know that 90% of the players aren't going to go on to play in the NCAA. On Saturday, you're going to watch U of, U of, U of Texas or A&M or whatever, or West Texas, whatever your, your local school is. And you're going to watch that game. And you're going to be into it as much as you were the game the night before, even though you know that 90% of the players aren't going to go on to the NFL. And then on Sunday, if you're in Texas, you're going to watch the Cowboys or the Texans, and you're going to enjoy that as much as you enjoyed Saturday, as much as you enjoyed Friday. Here in Canada, not only do we get the difference in leagues and games, but we get different strategies and different rules and different field, and it's a a completely different experience. So I've never understood why we don't embrace uh, the differences, you know, viva la difference. You know, it's uh, uh, it's fantastic that we have these options. And 
you know, watch a watch a CFL game on the Friday night and an NFL game on the Sunday. Enjoy both for the incredible skill that, the, that these athletes have and the fact that you can have a different strategy. I think the rules in the CFL are certainly more fan-friendly than the NFL counterparts in every instance. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't, I don't love the NFL. You respect the ability of those players. And it's a great game and a great TV product. Likewise is the CFL. The NFL is one issue for the Argonauts, but you've also got a big market where you've got the Raptors, the Leafs, the Blue Jays. So you're kind of in swimming with the Sharks, as it were. It's tough. There's no question about that. Uh, I know that people uh, look out your way and say, hey, in, in Sask, for your entertainment dollar, if you're a sports fan, there's there's the Riders and the Rush in junior hockey. It's not cheap to go to, an, to a, to a uh, Leaf game or a Raptor game. Uh, you can get an Argo season ticket for less than what you're paying for uh, a decent leaf ticket. Uh, you know, we're trying to present ourselves as affordable and as a really good product. And I think the game day experience has gotten better and better each year. So uh, the, it's like the old beer commercial. Those that love us, love us a lot. Um, and we've just got to try to, to uh, reach out and, and find out why people are watching games on TV and not necessarily coming to games, although we've seen increases every year. And and we've really seen an increase in the number of young fans uh, because that's where most of our marketing strategy is going toward, uh, toward those kids who already have an interest in football as opposed to just throwing money out against the wall and saying, hey, uh, you might not like football, but come and watch us. Uh, you know, we're really going after the people who have shown at least uh, a mild interest in the game uh, and hopefully that they become Argo fans. So we're not just talking about them now. We're talking about them 40 years from now and they're bringing their kids to game. You, you mentioned that demographic, but the other thing, too, in, in the game day experience, I've been to BMO to watch the Argos. I, I can't get past how loud it gets there. We have we have those roofs on top of the uh, I'm on the press box on the west side. Uh, behind the benches, and there's that roof over top. It's amazing how loud it gets. It holds in the sound. So as loud as it is lower, it gets even. Uh, it gets a little louder because it reverberates and echoes around up there. It's astonishing how loud it gets. And our fans are crazy. Um, you know, we get knocked for the numbers of fans that we have. I will put our fan base up against any in pro sports in terms of passion. And to a large extent, it's because they have to be, because they get kicked so often. Uh, you get very defensive of the league and the team if you're an Argo fan in Toronto. So when you get that opportunity uh, to be with like-minded people and you all share that passion that you really have, uh, it, they they are loud and proud. And boy, uh, the, the, the noise that was made uh, with 21,000 for the Eastern Final uh, last year and the year before, even though there was a goodly chunk of Ticat fans down for that one. Uh, it was almost all Argo fans this year, and it was exceptionally loud, and there's no doubt it made a difference in that ballgame. One of the key players in that game, McLeod Bethel-Thompson, is not coming back. Your thoughts on, on his decision that he took to uh, join with the USFL's breakers? It's, it, it's funny because, you know, when you do this as long as you do, every once in a while I'll get a, who's your favorite Argo ever? And it's impossible. It's just impossible when you get to know these guys. But if I were to put together a short list, there's no way Matt is not on it. You respect the journey, first of all. I think he played for 412 teams in 95 leagues on his way to get here. Like he was just that guy that kept bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. He put it all out there. He works exceptionally hard and put himself in a position to succeed. You know, he he came in to back up Ricky Ray. Ricky gets injured, and then there's a decision made to put James Franklin in as starting quarterback. And that wasn't a unanimous decision in the organization. And does it hurt Matt? No, he keeps going, he keeps going, he keeps going. He finally gets the opportunity in 2018. Uh, and then they bring in Arbuckle. <laughs> so it's like, you know, what's he what's he got to do? He wins the job. He wins it again this year over Chad Kelly. Leads the league in passing. And it ends not the way he wants with him taking the knee at the end of the game. But he put us in a position to uh, to, to get to the Grey Cup and and to win the Grey Cup. And Chad came in and mopped up and was was fantastic in relief. Mac is one of the most interesting guys I've met. He's one of the most likable guys I've met. You ask him to do something, he'll do it, even though uh, it may he might have something else to do. He understands his role as a quarterback and 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 getting the message out there. His his wife is based in Atlanta. I, I think most people know the story. Uh, she's a creator of a Marvel Comics TV show. It's out of Atlanta. He wanted to be close 
to his family. They've got a young daughter. The hub that he's playing out of at the USFL is in Birmingham, Alabama. It's a two-hour drive to Atlanta. That's why he went. He could still play football. I'm sure he left potentially a lot of money on the table uh, by leaving Toronto to go and be with his family, uh, where if it's an off night, his family can come and see him or he can drive and see them. Uh, nobody faults him for what he did. It's not a talent drain to the USFL. It's a unique situation for a guy who can still play football, be with his family, and if there's still an outside chance of him getting to the NFL, if he goes and lights it up in the USFL, uh, there's still that opportunity as well. Uh, I wish him nothing but the best. He's been nothing but uh, a joy to work with, and we're going to miss him around here both on and off. Thompson represents what I find in a lot of Canadian Football League players, and that is an absolute joy for the game. A lot of guys get that back when they come here, because when you go through the NFL ringer, uh, where you go from practice roster to practice roster, and you get promised things, and they're taken away, and you end up in three cities in two years, or, you know, what was Max track? Three stops in San Francisco, two in Miami, two in Minnesota, Philadelphia, and New England. Uh, before he came to Canada, the United Football League. And like he's he's basically done it all. That wears on you. And you have to have that passion to keep going. When people keep telling you no, and you've got a belief in yourself and a passion for the game. I've talked to so many guys who have been through the NFL ring or come up here, and I'll ask them, are you having fun again? And they go, oh my God. They they, They revisit that joy they had playing the game, maybe in high school, because the guys who go to the, the to the D1 football factories, it becomes almost a full-time job. And then likewise with, uh, with the NFL. And I'm not saying CFL football isn't a full-time job, but when you've gone through the ringer and, and you're now given an opportunity where the, the days are less uh, time-consuming because of the CBA, you've got a little bit more time and you can relax with your buddies. And that, that's what a lot of them do. They'll just they go shoot some hoops or, or go out and watch uh, or play video games or whatever with their guys or go out for dinner. Uh, it really, really, this league does lead, uh, lead to a lot of team bonding that maybe you don't get in the bigger leagues. Part of uh, Thompson's goodbye note sort of mentions the whole notion that he had, at least, and maybe a lot of people have, is that this league is undervalued and underappreciated. No question. Uh, the, the thing that drives me nuts or drove me nuts when I was working in radio, I'd go in, I'd, I'd talk to a millennial or one of the younger guys, and, you know, I'll say, what did you, did you watch any football on the weekend? They say, oh, yeah. So what did you watch? And they say, oh, I watched Penn State play Michigan. And I'd say, did you watch the CFL game? And it's kind of no. And there's always that knowing, well, it's not any good. And I will say, you do realize that a CFL team would destroy teams of that level. And they kind of look at me and say, look, Maybe 10% of the guys on that field at Penn State will get an NFL snuff. There's no guarantee they're going to make it. And right now, they're 19 or 20-year-old kids. They're playing against a team where half of the roster has an NFL experience. It could be a few years. It could be a few minutes. uh, But they've been able to go through that. And do you think a 28-year-old isn't going to have a lot of fun with a 19-year-old in terms of experience and knowledge and just knowing how to set them up? Uh, the, the the talent level up here is phenomenal. And even the guys who never played D1, the, the U sports guys, have been practicing for a couple of years or playing against guys who have gone through the NFL. So they're going to get better. They're more progressed as a professional. Uh, the, the, the thumbing the nose of the talent level of the CFL makes no sense at all. Take the Tom Brady's out of the league or the Patrick Mahomes or the, the elite players at every position. And there are a couple of dozen of those. After that, the talent level becomes pretty close between that number two or three receiver in the in the States and the number one receiver in the CFL. There's not that much difference at all. And the Canadian content, we've had Nathan Rohr, Curly Gittins Jr. with the Argonauts. And who might not get the chance to play if not for that. You know, work is different because, you know, the, the American quarterback issue is an, a, another kettle of fish altogether. But if Curly Gittins Jr. isn't, a Canadian, he might not get the opportunity to develop. And his first year, I think he had one catch, right? And then he comes back and he's given the opportunity to play and he's learned the game and he has a better year. And this year he had a better year and rewarded with a, with a very good contract. You know, he's he's earned it, but it was that opportunity afforded by the CFL because of the ratio that has turned Curly Gittins Jr. into a star and a guy who knows even though he had a, a workout with, I think, the Patriots this year, you know, he's a guy who's going to be around the CFL potentially for a long time. 
since the turn of this century, the Argonauts are in rarefied air. Along with the Stampeders, they have won four Grey Cups. Uh, we won in 04, in 17, and 12. And so we've won four this millennium. So uh, we've won 18, which is more than anybody else. Yeah, this is a great history and a great recent run, although there have been a couple of dog years mixed in there as well. But you think about it, in the Toronto market, what team delivers championships? And it's the Argonauts. It's funny that ML- L- MLSE gets not, but since MLSC has taken over some teams, the Raptors have won, the Argos have won, TFC has won, the Marlies have won the Calder Cup, and uh, Toronto 905, the Raptors team, has won the D-League. So every team except the Leafs has won. Uh, So there's a winning culture in this organization. And, uh, you know, the Leafs have put themselves in a pretty good position this year. I don't know what happens, uh, but but it's not for for lack of effort and a lack of ability putting these teams together. So uh, we're in a fortunate position to be owned by who we are. And, uh, yeah, it's it's become a uh, it's become a, a company of champions. 2017, Bo Levi Mitchell's going down the field. Looks like the Stampeders are going to put the game away. Throws an out pattern. Kamar Jordan doesn't quite make it to ground. And next thing you know, Cassius Vaughn is in the other end zone and the game flips. What was that like for you? I was on the Argo sideline doing sort of the Matt Shinetti role. Uh, for Argo, for the uh, national TSN radio broadcast. And obviously I have an affinity for the Argos and it had been there, not an employee of the team yet, but, but uh, you know, working as a play-by-play guy. So I, I had an emotional tie, obviously. So they're going in, there's like three minutes left. And they need a, they're up by eight, Calgary. Is they need a single point to make it a two-score game in a snowstorm. Uh, and even with Ricky Ray, that's tough, no pun intended, tough sledding uh, on that field. I don't think I've ever been around a situation where it's gone from such a low to such a high. The Robbie Smith block kick this year was close, uh, and that won it. You know, the shoulders weren't down because it was a long field goal attempt, uh, and there was a chance that we'd miss, and there'd still be time left on the clock. With the the Cassius Vaughn thing, like, everybody was just really, really quiet, and the explosion on that sideline something I'm never going to forget. Um, you know, the fact that come back, Declan Cross catches a two-pointer. The thing that's never talked about is Liram Hyrolahu kicks a field goal in a snowstorm with, a, with I think it was like 35 yards or so, uh, with less than a minute left. And that's never talked about. And then, as you mentioned, Bo goes the other way. They're in field goal range. Uh, no gimme in that weather, although their field goal kicker ain't bad. Bo went for it all, and, uh, and Matt Black picks it off, uh, double coverage. It's funny because I was blocked on that play by the bench. I was sort of between the two benches. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to see the pass on the field and wasn't smart enough to look up at the scoreboard. So I was just watching the ball and watching Matt Black, who was playing center field, essentially. And Matt is hauling rear end over to that side of the field. So all I'm doing is I'm doing this. Is he going to get there? I think he's going to get there. Not even thinking about Jermaine Gabriel in single coverage. Uh, but just wondering if Matt was going to be there to maybe knock it away. And when the bench erupted the way it did, I knew it wasn't a knockdown. So I never saw the interception, but lived it. 2022. (laughs) A game that it sort of muddled along, all of a sudden in the last five minutes goes insane. Yes, uh, there's a a podcast, X's and Argos, excellent for CFL fans to give a listen. Uh, JB is a co-host with Ben Grant, and their their post CFL and their post breakup podcast. He said that game was drunk. <laughs> it was a perfect way to describe the last fifteen minutes, where you had a record-setting punt return and a couple of interceptions, and player with two sacks on two plays but gets nabbed for a face mask, and then three plays later blocks the field goal attempt to win the game. Like it was it was crazy. Two blocked field goals in a minute, like in a minute. It was nuts. To be on the sideline for that was just, you know, the stomach was up and down the entire fourth quarter. But the, as a first great cup, as an employee, uh, it was just different. It was just different. Uh, it was a remarkable game. You know, I thought, I think if the Argos and, and Bombers played 10 times, uh, it would be five each. Uh, they were so closely paired. Uh, the, you know, they had some strengths of our weaknesses and vice versa. It was just, it was just a fantastic game. And I, I'm, I'm glad to have been a, an arm's length part of a show uh, that the two teams put on for Canadian football fans because it was a great advertisement. Given the deletions and given the additions, where do you think they are? 
I'm excited. You know, I'm excited to see what Chad can do. We we have all, all seen the capabilities he has. I'm curious to see what they do to bring in uh, a QB3 or a QB2. You know, it's, it's going to be an open competition no matter who they bring in. I'm really interested to see that. I can't wait to see this defense. Like, I cannot wait to see this defense. We all wish Jamal Peters the best, obviously, with Atlanta. If it doesn't work out for him and he comes back, that's an even uh, another piece coming back uh, because he was so good leading the league in interceptions last year. Uh, Arimolade coming in and Jordan Williams coming in, you know, Pickett coming in. Our front seven was good last year. It's going to be equally good, if not better, this year. Uh, a little younger, a little faster, maybe. So I just, I, I can't wait. And to get Enoch back as well, Mwamba. It's just the rich got really rich. And I, I can't wait to see what Corey Mace does with this group this year. I can virtually guarantee you that the Argos aren't going to go to training camp with two quarterbacks. Somebody will be brought in, whether it's an American off a neg list or uh, somebody who's between NFL jobs. Somebody, a quarterback or two, will join Ben Holmes and Chad Kelly in camp this year. So um, we're not going to go to camp with two guys. That's that's the, that's an obvious one. And I'm as curious as anybody else to see if uh, we make a deal with the CFL team or bring in uh, one of the free agents that's available or uh, bring in somebody off our neg list or somebody who's on the beach, so to speak, down in the States. So uh, Chad, no matter who they bring in, Chad's going to be the front runner. But as Ryan Dinwiddie has said, we're not just going to say, here are the keys to the car, go. You've got to earn it in camp. Uh, he will get the first reps, I would assume, and we'll see what happens. And somebody's going to come in, and with Ben Holmes, don't sleep on him. Uh, he knows there's an opportunity for him as well. So uh, he's going to come in hungry. He's been working out hard, uh, and whoever they bring in is going to push Chad. But right now, when you look at our depth chart, there's zero question Chad Kelly's QB1. Where do you think the Argos will be come November? Are they going to be back in the big game in Hamilton? I don't know where we're going to be. I know where I hope we're going to be. This year, the East is the home team for the Grey Cup, which would mean we would take over the Ticats locker room. Just saying, that might be a little fun. So there's there's that carrot out there. Uh, I know the Ticats want to get back and try and win one at home. And, and Montreal and, and Ottawa are both both look to be improved from a year ago, so they're both hungry. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be fun in the East, and uh, it's not gonna be easy. But uh, obviously. Uh, as an employee of the Argonauts and as a fan of the Argonauts before that, I'm hoping there's a double boot presence in the Great Cup this year. Mike Hogan, TSN 1050, voice of the Argonauts, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Really appreciated the opportunity to get to talk with you. Anytime. This was a lot of fun. And uh, just remember, everybody, as my friend Jim Mullen says on Crown Gridiron Nation, uh, let's get out to the game. Uh, where The CFL community is a great one. Let's just make sure we fill the buildings. Good stuff. Thanks. Thank you for listening to our show. Third Down Gamble is hosted on Podbean and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter at Third Down Gamble. Join us again the Third Down Gamble podcast. Audio worth watching. Third Down Gamble uses the expert resources provided by Canadian Football League Player and Game Statistics for analytics, game notes, and statistics, and 3downnation.com for news, insight, and in-depth analysis. Please visit cfl.ca and 3downnation.com for the most up-to-date information on the Canadian Football League.